Hey everybody. Next up this week in our mediation and moderation series is two two-way moderation or double moderation. So this is two two-way interactions rather than one three-way interaction. So this is model two uh, in process and SPSS. I don't know how often people use this model versus a three-way interaction, which I believe is model three, but this is a good lead-in to working with um, multiple interactions, and it kind of almost works the same as the three-way interaction when it comes to the output. So this will kind of get you prepared for three-way interaction, which we'll cover, um, I've done before, and we'll cover in this new series coming down the road. So I drew a quick model visualization of how this looks. And you'll notice that both moderator one and moderator two impact the X to Y relationship, but it's not moderator one impacting moderator two, which impacts X, that would be a three-way interaction. So the way this is gonna give us to us is X predicting Y, X times M predicting Y, X times M2 predicting Y, and then M1 and M2 predicting Y. So you're actually gonna get a bunch of predictors here, uh, but you won't get X times M1 times M2. If you want that, that's model three. We're also gonna do this with a covariate. Then we're gonna go back and test model six and model this model with categorical variables. So we're kind of like iterating through all the possible combinations. Okay. So to do this, I'm gonna use the exact same example I used last week, except now we're gonna do it as a moderation instead of a mediation. So a lot of this would be very similar, but um, if you haven't watched last week's video, we're still gonna do data screening because the number of predictors is gonna be different between mediation and moderation. All right, so what we have is a faculty data set of uh, course eval ratings, and we're gonna use X as the grade a student expects to get in the course. So that's here under X. It's gonna be moderated by, are the exams a good representation of the course material? So are the exams fair? When predicting the overall course rating. Additionally, we think that the what grade do you get, expect to get is moderated by are the grades fair predicting overall course rating. Okay, so we're saying that there's a, some sort of interaction between what grade we're gonna get and are the exams fair and what grade we're gonna get and are the, is the grading system fair predicting why, which is uh, an overall rating of the course. Okay. Uh, we're gonna covary out is this a course I wanted to take because often when students are required to take, let's say statistics, they um, take that out on the course and the instructor, even though it's not um, anything to do with the instruction style, it's more of that they just didn't wanna be there in the first place. So as usual, let's start with power, but um, as we always say, we gotta figure out the number of predictors. So let's figure out the of predictors here. Goodness. So we'll easily have X, M1, and M2 as predictors and our CV. But then we're going to have X times M1 and X times M2. So um, when estimating power, you need to remember to always add in those interaction components because otherwise you're pr predicting power with too few um, K variables. So in this case, K, which we'll use down in a little bit, is one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. And you can always check that if you have some like dummy data or if you have another data set, you can just kind of click through and run the analysis or you can watch the video here and we'll make sure that we have six predictors here in a little bit. So to do this, I'm gonna look at G power. Right. I'm gonna go down to F test. We're gonna say fixed effects r squared deviation from zero. So you'd use this one if you just want to test um, the r squared for the overall final model. Like, I don't know how much the interaction is, but let's say I know the r squared in total should be about, um, let's say 0.07. So I'm expecting maybe a, a medium effect size. I'm gonna hit calculate and transfer to main to convert that to f squared. We'll use alpha's 0.05 and power's 0.8, but remember you should justify these choices. And the number of predictors should be six. 
This doesn't need 188 participants. We have like 3,700 in this data set, so we should be good. The other thing that you can do is if you know how much you expect that uh, interaction component to add to the model, we could do uh, R squared increase. I'm going to click direct over here in the effect size component. And let's say we expect the R squared to be 0.03 and addition of 0.03. Calculating transfer to main. Alpha power, oops. The number of tested predictors here is going to be 2. X times M1 plus X times M2. And the total number of predictors is 6. So this is like the addition of those interaction components. And that tells me I need 315 participants. So that's kind of two ways to guess. If you know how much you think the interaction effect size should be, this is going to be better for you because it should help you uh, power the interaction. If you don't know that, you can try the other way just to make sure that you've at least powered your regression totally. Okay. So that is power. And all those screenshots will be added to this guide. All of these guide pieces can be found on our GitHub page, which is linked below. So popping over to SPSS here. Um, we're going to data screen this data set just like we did last week um, by starting by running a regression analysis without any of those interactions. So we're just kind of kind of screen the data without the interactions uh, to make sure that we don't have anything weird going on. Okay. Now we could do this as a fake regression. If you've been watching the channel for a while, I have some videos on how to run data screening in, uh, across all types of tests. But we'll leave this here still predicting why, because we actually do have a regression analysis. So let's go analyze, descriptives, and frequencies to just check, make sure the data looks good. So I've got question one, three, four, 12 is my CV, 15. Under statistics, I can tell it's giving me the mean, standard deviation, the min, the max, just to make sure that I don't have anything out of range. I'm gonna turn off frequency tables so we don't get big huge tables for continuous data. Okay. So here I can see I don't have any missing data. I have 3742 participants or course evals here. Um, I can see that the average scores are not about what you'd expect for faculty evals, close to ceiling, right. standard deviations, and none are outside the range of the expected data, which is one to five. So I would say the data is, has no missing data and is accurate. Working on other assumptions, let's go analyze, regression, linear. I'm going to put y, which is question one, in the dependent box. All, th all of the predictors, so 3, 4, 12, 15, in the independence box. Oh, not statistics, sorry. Under plots, do z pred in y, z residual in x, ask for a histogram and a normal probability plot. This will give you um, all of your assumptions. Under save, we're going to do one, two, three for Mahalanobis, Cooks, and Leverage. Okay. So this will give us our three different ways to look, see if our um, data points are outliers. Continue and OK. We're going to let this run and go back to the data. So first thing we want to deal with is outliers. And we will cut, we've done this a couple of times on the channel, but we want to figure out the cutoff scores for these three outliers so we can screen them and see how many people are outliers on all of them. So for my degrees of freedom, I only have four degrees of freedom because I've only put in four predictors into the equation. So I didn't add those interactions. You could make those interactions and add them and screen them as well. Um, I would say both ways pretty valid. Um, either way, screen your data. So we're just looking here at these four. Okay. That means our cutoff score for four, coming over here at 0.001, because we want scores to be very, very weird before we delete them, is 1847. Okay. Let's go ahead and figure out these bad boys. So we've got Cooks as four divided by 3742 minus four minus one. 
How I pull out my trusty phone calculator? 3742 minus 5. is 0 0.001 if I am one one if I round up and this is going to be 2 times 4 plus 2 which is 10 divided by 3742 that's participants okay it's 0 0.0027 With that information, I can now do my outlier screening. So this should be the same as last week. All right, so I'm gonna do transform, compute variable. All right, so we're gonna call this variable Bab Mahal. And we're gonna flag anybody whose Mahalanobis distance is greater than 18.47. And what that does is it creates this column for us out here in the data that marks people as an outlier with one and not an outlier with zero. We do that twice more for cooks and for leverage. Transform, compute, bad cooks, oops, linguistic thing there. Cooks that's greater than 0 0.0011 would be bad. Transform, compute, and then we'll do bad leverage. Greater than 0 0.0027. Now with all of that, I could look at each piece separately and kind of work on figuring that out, or I could transform, compute one more time and create a total score. Now you could do each of these, like this one total all at once with a compute variable, but um, I like having all three columns just in case you decide that you only want to do cooks later or only want to do Mahalanobis later. I can keep some more information for you. All right, so we're going to follow the two strikes you're out rule and exclude everyone who has two or more indicators of being an outlier. And we'll just assume that those courses were scored very funny. And um, in this first course, somebody marked the overall rating as uh, everyone put one, which is probably a little unusual given that most of these are, you know, kind of mixed average. And so that's probably why that one is an outlier. Whereas in this other one, the combination of scores is probably very different as well, where everyone is uh, marking the score as the most perfect thing they've ever taken. But question one is that, um, oh, everybody's getting an A, I'm sorry but they all hate the course. So it's probably the combination of variables. To exclude just those people, but keep everyone in your data set, go to data, select cases. We're gonna do if condition. And remember this is picking the people that you wanna keep. So we'll click if here, do bad total less than two. So we're kind of doing this the other way. We wanna keep everyone who has only one indicator or no indicators. And that creates you this filter out variable. The filter doesn't stay. The column stays, but the filter itself doesn't stay if you uh, close the data set. So if you want to use this again, you would just do data, select cases, and you can actually do based on a filter variable. So if you're doing this again later, that's how you'd use that filter variable later. With that being said, now let's go ahead and do this double moderation. So analyze, regression, we're using process version three. I'm going to put uh, the overall course rating into Y, the grade a student is making into X. Moderator number one goes into W, and moderator number two goes into Z. Okay, so you can have up to two moderators in these models. Click model number two, or this won't run because it'll be mad at you for having two of them. Click Options, and there are a couple ones we could do. So generate code for visualizing interactions, which you can use in Excel or another version of SPSS. Um, mean Center for Construction of Products, because that's very, the most common thing to do to deal with multicollinearity. 
and then we'll leave, uh, we'll change our conditioning values here to one standard deviation below the mean, the mean, and one standard deviation above the mean. This is the normal simple slopes process. I'm not going to select the Johnson name in on this one because it's insane. So <laughs> I'm just going to stick with um, looking at one below and one above. Hit continue and OK. Double click on this, copy it all, go over here to Word and just work from Word. All right, so we're gonna type up every one of these predictor variables because we'd be here all day, but we'll walk through um, a good majority of them, but it reminds you at the top what you did. First thing it gives you is that overall model summary. So this is where you could write this up and say whether or not the overall model with all six predictors, did we get that right? Of the six. So one, two, three, four, five, where's 12? Oh no, I forgot my covariate. <laughs> so we're gonna do that again. <laughs> so, okay, don't look at that one. Um, let's run, let's go analyze, regression, process, if you want to include a covariate, which is what we, I meant to do, put the covariate in the covariate box here. Click OK. This time we'll get the analysis we actually wanted. All right, it reminds you of everything that you did at the top here. Do, 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 right. Um, here's our covariate. So let's check and see if I got my uh, correct. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's where I was getting six for power. But the first thing I can do is talk about uh, are all six predictors useful at predicting why? So this model summary here tells me if all six of them together are greater than zero at predicting why. So basically test R squared is different from zero. And it is, so write this up in APA style. We're gonna go six and three, six, oh, five. Right, so that's these two numbers. It doesn't totally line up when you paste it into Word, but usually you can kind of figure it out. We'll fill in F here, 1151.95. We'll say P is less than 001, right? Because we don't want to write that P is zero. So we use that number and this number. Because P is never really zero, but the probability here is less than 0.001. We're also gonna do R squared. Oops, wrong way. Okay, and that is 0.66. So this is all predictors to Y. So the model itself has a significant amount of variance over zero. Okay. Now, significance, it is, you know, it's got kind of a bad rap lately, but here I'd really focus on that R squared and it is a large effect size. So we're predicting a lot of the variance in Y. So 67% of the torsi valves can be attributed to our um, predictors here. Now we'll come down here and we'll look at um, each one of these predictors, but specifically you'll kind of like look at X first. So let's think about question 15, which is your grade in the course. Okay, that seems to not predict Y. So when I look at this line here, so there's the coefficient standard error T, P. So the grade in the course does not predict overall course evaluation. Then remember that's question one in the data set. Ugh. Can't even spell the word not today. <laughs> and so we could report that as B equals 0 0.001 if I round up. T with our degrees of freedom would be the second degree of freedom from up here, so 3605. 
equals so standard uh, coefficient standard RT is 0 0.52 and our p value equals 0 0.603. Okay. Now with this many predicts, it's only six, so you could probably write them up in the paragraph or you could put them in a table. One thing I see people do is if they're not significant, they just ignore it. Be sure you're still reporting whether or not each predictor was significant. Okay. So gray doesn't predict. We could follow that same procedure. So question three, the main effect of does predict. So I should clarify that these are main effects. Okay. Kind of like an ANOVA main effect. So we could say question three, um, does predict gray overall course eval. And question three was exam fairness. And we'd write that up in the same way. We'd look at question four. So question four is grade fairness. Does predict overall course evaluation. Okay. So we'd walk through here. And then we'd do this one. And since these are all on the same scale, I can tell that question three is a little bit better predictor than question four. Um, that does not mean significantly better. Um, I can just tell this is a slightly larger predictor. Now our covariate, we would just interpret as an adjuster. So question 12, which is course I wanted to take, uh, significantly adjusted uh, overall course evaluation and this is if you treat it want to treat it just like a covariating out you could also say it predicted because it does um, and then we'd write this one up in the same way but now I want to get to the interactions oops so those interactions So interaction one, it shows you right here, is question 15 by question three. So this is question 15 about my grade I'm making the course by question three, which is about the exam fairness. Okay. And I could write that up as B equals, here's the interaction, negative 0.11, which is sort of interesting. Right? So our T value is 3605. So I'm writing this up in the exact same way I do all the rest of them. So coefficient standard error T is 2.21 here. P equals, here's 0.027. Okay. And that's actually the same thing you'll see right here. And so what this tells me is that the addition of the interaction, so I'm kind of working from the top and the bottom here. So the addition of the interaction, um, I could write up as F13605 is, so I'm doing that from here, it's 4.90. Your p value will be the same because it's only one variable. Okay. And our R squared change, which we'd want to do is delta R squared. Um, so you'd insert the little delta here. Is 0 0.001 if I round up. So this is probably a small effect, right? So it's a small effect of the addition of that interaction. It's likely significant because we have a very large um, sample size. So we could do the same thing with the second one. So the interaction two, so it'd be question 15 times question four about exam fairness at B value is 0.15. Our T values 3605, and that's 253. T value is 0.001, or I'm sorry, 0.011. Okay. Now that's the same thing as writing this F statistic as 
as 1, 3, 6, 0, 5, 6 6.41 p is equal to 0 0.011. Our change in r squared is basically the same, 0 0.001 if I round up. So this is a small effect as well. I tell you to do one, this one, or this one, not both. They tell you the exact same thing because um, if you square, uh, t squared is f. I'm gonna bring further for a second. So t squared is f. So um, these two coefficients, this set of numbers tells you the exact same thing as this set of numbers. The reason you might prefer the second nut set is because it tells you the change in r squared. So that's the utility of one over the other. This one tells me b, although I don't know how to really interpret this number just yet. This one tells me about the change in the, the uh, change in the effect size. And the next piece you're going to get is going to look crazy, but we'll break this down for you. And I think the easiest way to do this was to paste it into Word and just give yourself, make some little breaks here. So what this section is, is it's the low question three. So this is question three at a low simple slope. So remember, simple slopes are where we kind of like sh shift the data around to see what's happening in each area. This does not break them into categories. So this is not like saying uh, only classes that rate their teacher low. This is everybody, but sort of pretending as if we're looking at the low portion of the data. So this is low Q3. This is average Q3. And then this is high Q3. Within each one of those, what we're going to get is low Q3, low Q4. So this one's low Q4. Okay, this one's average Q4. And then this last one, wish that hadn't run off the line. It's much easier to read. There we go. And then this last one is high Q4. See if we can get all the letters on there. No, we'll just spell it like that. <laughs> so high. Um, so what's happening is we're getting low average and high of Q3, low average high, and then low average and high of Q4. So this creates a little three by three matrix of every combination of one standard deviation below the mean, one standard deviation above the mean. And that data is actually given to you here. So this is the sort of thing that I would either put into a graph or just put into a table. The, the part that you're going to be interested in here is the effect. So this third piece for each one. And it shows you the interaction. So at low Q3, so at a low, if they don't think the exams are very representative, the um, increasing fairness of the course um, increases the X on Y. So you kind of have to like think about this as like pieces at a time. So uh, here, I'll write this out. So at low exam fairness ratings, increasing Q4, so Q4 is over uh, grading fairness, lead to increasing X now, so X is uh, grades predicting overall course rating. Okay. So the way I did this was at low M1, increasing M2 leads to X to Y. Okay. And so I could do, just do those sentences one at a time as well. So at low exam fairness, and low uh, overall course ratings, there's no effect of x to y, right? So p here is not significant. So at low exam fairness and average um, grading fairness, x predicts y at about 0.06. Okay. But that increases, doubles basically from 0.06 to 0.11 uh, when people, students think the course is fair. So what's happening is when students don't think the exam is fair, but the grading gets more fair, 
the fact that they're making a better grade predicts overall course ratings more. And you see that same pattern for all three of them. So the, um, the interaction is that this, these effects, these uh, X numbers here are not the same. So if the interaction is not significant, these numbers will be very similar. Um, or it might be that the interaction occurs because one set of these numbers is the same and the other ones aren't. So we're getting that same pattern for all three of them. So at an average exam fairness, low grading fairness um, negatively predicts. It's not significant, but it negatively predicts uh, course, my course grade predicts the overall rating. But as ex, um, all grading fairness increases, so does the prediction of course grade to uh, overall ratings increases. So they're not increasing the same numbers, but they're both increasing together. And this gets a lot easier to see with a, with a picture. So let's make a picture. From there, we're going to go back to SPSS, do File, New, Syntax, okay. I'm going to paste that in there, just highlight everything and click Run, the big green arrow for Run. Okay. That's going to make you an entirely new data set, which disappeared somewhere. Okay, well, I thought it was going to make you a data set, but instead it just made you a graph here. Oh, this is a great graph because it's almost impossible to read. But what you can see, if we could clean this graph up some, this is X along the axis, and it's a, a um, three plots in one. So this is a low Q4, average Q4, high Q4. At each level, the colors represent stop, um, Q3 here. And so as we can see that the um, light colored dots here, which are high scores, and then the green colored dots here, which are our average scores, and then the blue dots, which are low scores. So those um, slopes are like negative to positive. This one's negative to positive, and this one's like nothing to positive. So um, they're all making this sort of nice fan effect. Because this creates a scatter plot, you can't really play connect the dots with these very well. I haven't found an easy way to do it, um, but you could use this data to make a graph in Excel or, and kind of, or kind of clean up this panel plot. So when you do that, you double click. I have trouble with this sometimes, SPSS likes to crash. <laughs> and so you can actually click on each one of these labels and just sort of change them. So this would be low Q, uh, Q4 we said was grading fairness. So I click once, click twice, clean this up to average grading. And high grading. And we can do that for all of our labels to help this make a lot more sense. So this question here is the grade they expect to get in the course. And we're trying to use that to predict and this is why I said I have trouble with this sometimes. It's not going to let me click on this one for no good reason. And this one is exam fairness. And you can get in here and fix each one of these individually as well. So essentially, if we could get rid of these backgrounds, it might be a little easier to see. So let's make them transparent here. So I double clicked, made them transparent. And we can kind of keep playing with these um, colors maybe to like kind of make the whole thing just a bit more clear, so made those blue, switch here, 
Goodness, I didn't mean to make them both blue. Well, if you can get this to work for you, let's see what happens if I make it black. Why? Oh, I made them all black, so I've made it worse. But you get the idea. We would want to find some way to help distinguish what's happening in this plot. And now I can see the dots a little better, but I don't know which group is which because I screwed up the coloring. But you can kind of see that this is a very subtle effect. When you have moderation effects, you normally see a nice fan. So the slopes create this sort of fanning out pattern. And I kind of see that because this one's negative and they go to flat. Um, these kind of look all flat. And this one's positive and they go to, or I'm sorry, this one's flat and they go to positive. So we get this kind of small fan effect. The larger the effect of the interaction, the bigger the fan is going to be. So you'll see even more distinction between these. This is a very small effect, which the graph makes it kind of easy. Interpretation of these is the most difficult part. Um, and mostly because you're working with two sets of variables. Uh, you're breaking down two sets of variables and then interpreting the correlation basically between X and Y or the partial effect. And so the way I think is the easiest to do that is to either make a better picture that you could see <laughs> or to just talk about each piece one at a time. So going back over to here to Word, I would talk about each one of these betas one, or um, B values one at a time. So at low this and low that, here's the effect of X to Y. At low this, average that, here's the effect of X to Y. And so they even kind of giving people a picture of all three of them for each uh, M1. So do all three low, all three average, and then all three high. Um, but these are the most difficult things to write. We've done several that have th three-way interactions and you have to do this in a similar way. So when we get to three-way interactions, this will look familiar because it's actually the same type of follow-up analysis. It's just you're dealing with three-way part of it um, instead of having two two-way interactions. So they're very similar. So model two to model three is not a huge difference um, because instead you just get more predictors. Okay, so hopefully that helped you a little bit with two-way interactions, um, especially having two of them in the same analysis. Uh, this video covered two two-way interactions, so moderation analysis number two, talked about power, effect size, and how to read and interpret one of all these analyses and how to also screw up a SPSS graph. Um, so don't make them all the same color. But come back mm, tomorrow for the R version of this video and next week for more examples of mediation and moderation.